I temporarily can't leave the Marines because uh, without, without high school, I can't go anywhere. I gotta go get me some education. <clears throat> so I got no guidance, you know, I don't know where to go. But his one pilot, he kind of liked me, so I asked him where he went to school. <clears throat> Why don't you go to school, sir? I went to Syracuse University. <clears throat> Did you like that place? He went to about Syracuse. Okay. I have no other information, I'll go to Syracuse. That's simple. I'll go there. I got, I got no other guidance. <clears throat> Trouble is, Syracuse didn't take me. Without high school, I can't get in, but I showed up anyway. I'm on the deck here asking me about how I fixed it. And they said, go see the ding. Okay, I'll go see the ding. So I charged past the secretaries into the thing. <clears throat> Sir, private child lab, I never finished school. And I'm just back in the Marine Corps and I'm ready to go to work, okay? Let's go to work. He didn't even ask me my name. <coughs> he looked at teenage Marine, he said, of course, of course. Walk down from the trick like this, gentlemen. Well, life happens, that's a human situation. No university in this country could have turned this teenage Marine. You can't. Kids here wants to go to work, okay? Give us a message. If you don't make it, throw them out. That simple, huh? So, that's why I got accepted to Syracuse. My answer, you know, what's that mean? For you, it's you don't take no for an answer, and it's another way to get there. So that's a child game. You stop this kitchen, climbing the stairs, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Your kids get an idea how to do life, you just keep going, man. You don't take no for an answer. There's another way to get there. And so, now I've been trying to survive a whole lot. Survive the farm, survive the marine. And so, it's factors. I don't care what you do in this critical list. I don't care what your occupation is, where you're trying to go in life. You must identify the factors that will help you get there and the factors that will stop you from getting there. Every situation you are in, trying to get to the finish line, the objectives, there are factors which are influencing that situation and you've got to identify them and control them within a certain bound. <clears throat> That's what I'm thinking. Curiosity, imagination, that's what I do. That's what I've got in life. Just do the details, that's all. And so, I found out at the university, you know, if you want to take those things, there's a math can handle them. So that's what it is. System analysis is system. Whatever you're doing in life is a system, and it's part of other systems, you know, and stuff. So that led to my first major, multivariate calculus and multivariate statistics. And that's wild stuff for a 20-year-old farm kid. It's so bad, I love it. I love math. Deal with it. Deal with it. Deal with the numbers, deal with all that kind of stuff. Okay, statistical analysis, this is Duke Carey, North Carolina. They got the best software in the world, I believe. Multivariate statistics, I go there every year. I don't let stuff go. I could teach you multivariate statistics in 20 minutes. I don't let that stuff go. That's who I am today, I'm multivariate. I think of all the darn factors. I deal with the cases. Well, you see, I stay sharp in it today. I don't let it go. Because that's what I got to offer to the world. Multivariate thinking. I can think of all different kinds of domains. Well, <clears throat> that's all fine, but the first week in school, I, I'm looking for the Marine Corps Active Reserve. I told you the Active Reserve. They had no airplanes to play with, but I had tanks. So I drove tanks all the way through college. And there's also a tank mechanic. My tank broke. I wasn't supposed to be willing to fix it, but I fixed it before they filled out the paperwork. So I'm a tank mechanic too. <laughs> See how it goes? <clears throat> and so that's no fun. I'm a 20 year old kid that's got 810 horsepower B12. I mean, you know what I mean? Do you like 810 horsepower? You doing your tractors? You know, what more do you want? Okay, well, that's the good news is the bad news is the boat is inside the cab with you. And when it goes bad, it's really bad. But you, you win the motor. So, that's what. Okay. And of course, I did this here too. Of course, I'm already having construction, so I'm bullets those two. Well, I got this little room at college, and I'm making so much money. Some of the money goes to the bank, but a lot of it just comes in as checks and cash. And the bureau drawer, the bureau's full of cash, the bed is full of cash, it's cash in the bed. I gotta do something with all this cash. I'm going to school with all the cash flow in there. What's all the cash stuff? You know what a farm kid does? A farm kid throws bales of hay, bags of grain, bundles of corn. That's what a farm kid does, is lift and throw. Well, in high school, yeah, wrestling. I did wrestling team, so I took up wrestling. The rest of the kids took up weightlifting to get strong. I'm five years ahead of them, and they can't catch me. So I'm undefeated wrestling in high school. I go through all this Marine Corps combat training and all that high school stuff, wrestling, and I go to Syracuse. I have wrestling team. Well, I'll go do that. So as a freshman, I made the varsity wrestling team right off. First major, varsity. Within a month, I'm on an athletic scholarship. You know, 
the, the hay bales is paying for a little more than tuition. <laughs> the hay bales paying for the whole thing. Now, the GI Bill from the Marines, they are paying for the whole thing too, and they don't talk to each other. <laughs> I'm making twice the money I need. The tanks is number three, and the bulldozers is number four. I'm making four times the money I need to go to college. I gotta spend it on something. Now, you get an idea how to do what? I gotta spend it on something, I spend it on this. <laughs> So I drive in this, going to, this uh, farm kid driving this, going through college. It is, out of seven years of Corvette, it is the classic. It is the classical Corvette. Don't give me the credit for it. For having, it was the one around when I got to buy some. Of course, GM didn't know how to do a sports car ride system. I, I took up a welding torch out and I fixed that. They just had straps. They pulled up the tighten. No, no, nah, nah, there's a better way to do it. So I got my welds about working on Corvettes, too. That's what you look like. I think it's the curve, so I feel. Guess what I drive today? <laughs> That's my thing, it's a 94. And I took a flying, there's no space for it. Doesn't exist yet. Spudnik's not going on. I'm just flying because I like to fly. But you see where this is going, right? I just like to fly. But Dale Dragger, I owned a 150 for 10 years, I owned a 172. Okay, I'm still dealing with these variables and numbers. I'm off to UCLA. In what was called operations research back then, but it's really system design and engineering. And I got I need a computer to deal with all my stuff. So I got into uh, mainframes, set nice. a vacuum tube processor. No one knows what vacuum tube is. Yeah. Oh, do you? Yeah. Oh, you do. Okay. Well, they got hurt, so you know about that. <laughs> And so I ended up being a computer mechanic too, because I'm stuck with variables in one end, I look at what comes out the other end, and I could find out which vacuum to burn out faster than the real one. So I'm a computer mechanic now too. You see how I go? <clears throat> well, from all this machine stuff, I got used to how brain works. Leave it alone, story, leave it alone. You know, oh, yeah, leave it alone. I can't leave it alone. Okay. It's another fork in the road. Where are we going next? I gotta go study the brain. What's the lesson? Follow your heart, follow your dreams, follow your passion. Follow your heart, folks. What are you excited about? Ah, curious. How's the brain work? We're going to go do that. We'll worry about consequences later. <laughs> For now, follow your heart. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go do that. Well, I think I'll just go back to Syracuse because I want They already got to pay. They already matriculated. I just go and take my pre med course. See, I don't have pre med. <clears throat> Courses. But I crossed the Ohio River here on the way going to the East Coast. I run into this 230 year old beautiful town called Marion, Ohio. I says, Wow, this is an incredible little town. I was driving around this place excited. And my goodness, there's a college here, too. Well, oh, I find it what looks like the administration building I go in. And I said, Do you all have, um, you know, pre made courses here? Yes, sir. Do you have an application? Sir, we're a college. Of course we have an Give me one. Okay, I did my pre-med here. Follow your hearts, follow your passion. Okay, I'm not worried about it. If it's accredited or getting in medical school, I don't care. I like this place. Okay, I love this place. You can't go somewhere you don't like. I like this place. I'll go here. This is my medical school application. <laughs> I filled out all the air forms. I filled out their forms and took their tests, but I'm, I put one typewritten sheet on the whole top of the whole thing. See, and that's what I am. See, so farm equipment, heavy equipment, pilot, all this. I got in every medical school in the country. This is age 23, and that's my career. 23. It just happened one step at a time. But they saw this creature. This creature. We got here, he will do whatever he wants to do, and he'll fix whatever needs fixing. He'll get the job done. They saw it, he'll get the job done. Now, so, where we go? So I did my interviews here at Columbia Medical School in New York, and I thought that we, we had such good, great interviews at Manhattan, so I'll go here. So that's it, Columbia Presbyterian. That's George Washington Bridge. There's no Manhattan. Uh, so, First week of medical school, I ran into this door. This was on the door. Neurosurgical Research Lab, that's me. It's got neuro. It's got neuro, that's me. See, so you knock on the door and went, I want to work here. Who are you? Well, I'm a freshman medical student. We don't have those in here. You know, we have postdoc fellows and, and, and professors and stuff. I said, I'll work for nothing. Get hired. 
So if that gets you in the door, that gets you in the door. What are you now I love that. They didn't need more science, they needed a mechanical genius. It's all the electrodes, the oscilloscopes, the this, the manipulators, all this stuff. They needed a mechanical genius. They weren't getting there with their research. And I can really I took over the lab. I just made everything happen. I'm so pragmatic, practical. Within a month, I'm publishing papers, significant papers. I published about 15 papers as a medical student. And I'm presenting papers my way, and medicine's paid. I can go to any hospital, any university. <coughs> my way in medicine is paid because I'm a mechanical genius. So that was luck. You know, sometimes luck's good, sometimes it's bad. This was luck. They needed what I had to offer. Sometimes it's not compatible. Not needed it. And so, but across the river, across the Hudson River, right over here, is Lake New Jersey Sport Parish Civic Center in New Jersey. And I heard about people falling out of airplanes. The sport just came from France in 61. So this is way back when we didn't know what free fall was. People were falling out of airplanes, and I thought this was kind of an exciting idea. This was something to do. So, I started doing this. There's no space program for me yet, folks. And so, but I cannot leave my family in New York and tell them I'm going to go over the river and fall out of airplanes. It's just not responsible. <laughs> and I had a family. And so, you know, I went to medical school, and I had no kids. But until you took courses in obstetrics and gynecology and found out where they came from, <laughs> my kids were popping out every spring. <laughs> so medical school was four years. I left medical school with four children. <laughs> so, we okay. <laughs> Just uh, don't egg me on to go any further. <laughs> but anyway. I got to be responsible. I took my whole family to parachute with me. I took, I took them all. They went to the courses. They went to everything. And jump out of airplane. My instructor on the ground is talking to my helmet. I'm way down and I come down. I lay within 10 feet of my family. They thought, they saw how exasperated I am about details and I'm going to guarantee this outcome every time. It's what I do in life. What I do in life. Yeah, so. But how do you get good? It's best practice, you know, all stuff, procedures, checkers, military checkers, engaged interaction with other parachutists. Hey, come look at how I'm doing. Is this the way you're doing it? You know, watch them, how would they do it? And it's a publication, industry standards. Hey, how good can you be? Now, these folks are darn good anyway, but I brought military procedures, I brought the Marines, and I brought checkers. So we got together. For my tour of duty, we had 300,000 jumps and 0,000, okay? That's reasonable. Yeah, that is reasonable. Zero, 300,000 men. I'm not saying I'm a statistician. The odds are not zero. Pretty damn good. <laughs> Pretty darn good. And then, hey folks, that's what you do in life. You deal with the details, and you're good and you're excellent. In this case, I have to be. But I've never seen a reserve. I don't know what that. Yes, I got one already, but I've never seen one. I'm not going to do a reserve. So, now. It's time for me to go and do my surgical training. I'm finishing medical school. Through my Marine Corps channels, I heard about this fellow. And he's a, he, went to, he went to Yale, then he went to Harvard Medical School. And then he trained at Mass General, you know about that. And uh, he's taking the VJ to the Marines. What? He has no equipment. He's got no hospital. This doctor is taking the VJ to the Marines. He's doing it in Europe, he's doing it in the worst pillow loo and the worst uh, ones out in the Pacific. He got no equipment. He just tries to save the life. It is my time. First, where is he? I want him. I'll take him. And so I found him at the University of Kentucky Medical Center here. He was the founder and chairman of surgery there. So I said, okay, I'll go train with him. He's, he's my kind of person. That's all. So we, you know, he and I hit together, old man, and we hit it off. And so I'm doing my surgical training there, University of Kentucky. But that's the head of the science, and that's to put their heads together, and they're going to fly. Or we train scientists in space. The scientist astronaut program. Oh my God. I read about that in Science Magazine. Leave it alone story. I can't leave that alone. Everything I've ever done in life. So now, this is the point that science astronauts comes into it's something I can do in life. And so it's another big fork in the road. Here you go. Oh, what's the next? So I'm a great plagiarizer. This is in Pasadena. I guess it's contemporary art, but it's a fork and they got roads. 
Now, I know Master Cannon, the science, is not looking for more, more clinical training than one science. So I got an aerospace medicine, this device I came up with. I flew in the Skylab program, our first space station in 73, flew in the shuttle. And so I took a MS in biological physics and I was a minor in aeronautical engineer. That's why I got the education I got, because I'm, I'm changing fields. I got to get up to speed on the next one. But this graduate course in, in aeronautical engineering, we had to come up with a project. So I came up with a project of the aerodynamics of the free falling human body. It had never been studied. It's brand new, never been studied. So I did that project. And so that's some of my gear. This is a century ago, of course. Here's some of my gear they carried on board to record dynamic pressure out to that kind of stuff. But here's the real thing. So I had two telescopes. They were a mile apart, and I got a DC culture with sinks in it, keeps them in sync. And I got a person. All I got to do is I go out of the airplane, the person drags me on the way down, as from an elevation, both of them. That's a position in space on the way down. And I set a balloon up. You know, I sent a balloon up and record the same thing, because if you got a lot of wind, that's going to affect your fellow of the deep, your perceived fellow of the So I need to cancel out the wind. And so <clears throat> that's it. And we got incredibly good data. Even though this is way back in, uh, in 1964, the data we got in 64 is about a year ago they got today. So I turned a hobby into a formal research project that everyone loved, the Department of Defense loved it. The first time aerodynamics of human body ever been studied. I got no stories to tell you about this. Everyone came out, I opened my parachute at the right place at the right time every time. And so, and I did difficult jumps too. When you're jumping into a stadium for half time in the middle of the night, that's, that's not a nice jump. That's <laughs> that all kinds of stuff. That's bad. But you know, okay, it's a plan A. I did it in the daytime. I did it in the daytime and I had a plan B, C, D. If I can't get there, I'm gonna go. Here's a, here's a parking lot, here's a plan field. And then, I worked out all, all the lamps, all the posts, all the wires, everything else. You just work it out. I hey, Steve, you know, got no stories to tell you. I did become a commercial pilot and charter pilot here at Blue Grass Field. I'm increasing my aeronautical skills. You see, I'm getting ready for the selection process by NASA, which is going to be rough. I took up soaring, 222. That's my Bootstrap T34A. In today's colors, I got my airline transport rating. That's a PhD in aviation in this good bonanza. Okay. For this selection process, we had 6,000 applicants here, and they all had PhDs, doctors, done research, and how they became zero again. So, out of those 6,000, six of us got to space. Those are bad numbers. Those are horrible numbers. The last selection process, they got another one they started two weeks ago. The last one was 18,300 and took 12. It's just bad numbers. So, you just gotta, you gotta kind of psych it out what they're looking for and get up to speed. Well, the same week that I moved from Kentucky to Houston to join the astronaut corps, my boss here, he became chairman of the University of Colorado. And he's, he's missing me. And so he says, Story must give you, if you can break away from NASA for two or three days a month, I will turn you into a trauma surgeon. Yes, sir, I can do that. So I joined him at uh, Denver General Hospital up here. And uh, so for the next 28 years, I was a part time trauma surgeon two or three days a month. And so that's a recent picture. Now, I do not like what I'm saying here because uh, there were sirens are ringing and a bad and her patient comes in and they were waiting on a doctor to tell them what to do. The doctor's the boss, got to tell them what to do. Well, the doctor thinks they got to figure out where the patient's hurt before we can take action. We got to know where they're injured. We're trying to see where are they injured. You're not going to figure out where they're injured. They're hurt from the toe to the head. A fireman fell off three stories. You think he's going to know where it hurt? A bad bullet or something? Anyway, they're not going to figure out. So there's no action, and the patient goes off the morgue. The sirens ring. The next patient comes through off in the morgue. Hey, that's the not, that's not what I do in life. I don't take it. I don't save that life. So, so there you go. So I was just in Daytona for 500 uh, three days ago. That was a horrible ending, wasn't it? That last, that last, last, oh my goodness me. But he came out all right. Anyway, those folks are not waiting for the doctor to tell them what to do. You've got to specialize. You've got the left tire, you've got a tire off person, you've got a tire on person. You've got to jack the front, you've got to jack the back of your fuel. Oh, this is incredible. That's my emergency room. That's my emergency room. The record for change of four tires, the NASCAR record, is 2.4 seconds. I don't believe that. But NASA says it's the record. I'm not going to tell NASCAR. I'm not going to tell NASCAR what the record is. They got the record. It's 2.4 seconds. Can you believe it? 
four tires on and off. That's my virtue. When well, my patient, when my car comes in, that's what you're going to get. You don't need to wait on the doctor to tell you what to do. And it's, hey, who cannot be inspired by this kind of spirit? Who cannot be inspired by this spirit? It's just outrageous. And I know this game. Color coded, color coded for function. So I color coded it with my emergency room. So your physiology is six, but I changed the objective. I want only two things. You're not doctors, you're plumbers. I want oxygenated flow to the heart and to the head. If you ain't got a heart, you're dead. And the brain, two minutes without an option is starting to get some permanent damage. Okay, I want this and I want that and nothing else. I'll put you together later, but I'm gonna keep you alive. So, the outcome, here it is. Here's the thing. Me? I don't have to do nothing to me. Patient comes into physiology and says, how are we doing on the clothes? How are we doing the oxygen? That's all. And I gotta stop, you stop the blood loss. And but if we don't stop the blood loss, I'm gonna cut here, I'm gonna clamp the aorta, put turtle up both arms, and 100 percent of the flow comes out of the heart, it's going to the head, okay? You're trying to die on me and I ain't gonna let you. You're gonna stay. You stay with me. Fluid replacement. Hey, I don't do IVs. I slash and put the whole tool in. I do a whole pint in 30 seconds. And if that don't work, you get another one here, you're gonna get four pints simultaneously. You're gonna try and pass, I won't let you pass. I'm a plumber, okay? <laughs> and you're oxygenated. Okay, I didn't make a difference. I got a checklist on the wall. You're red, you got a red outfit, you got red equipment, and your red checklist on that. The blue checklist there, the green check, the first person medicine, put checklist on the wall. Okay, this is the way you're gonna do business. Place you gonna do. I made a difference, saving lives. And then, after you got the lives saved, now you put it back together. Now you go find out where you hurt, where we gotta put together. But meanwhile, the sirens ring, the next one's coming. The real doctors come in to put this thing back together. And they look at it and they say, it's another Musgrave mess. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a lot. You see how you do it? You bring NASA. No, NASA sent me to the Air Force because I don't have jets. Jets are very expensive. And of course, even though I came in the scientists asked me, they want you to have military wings. So I, I love the Air Force. I love, I, I love the Air Force. Okay, I'm Marine. I got an airline chance, but listen, I love the Air Force. I stay with the Air Force, no? I love their culture. It's a different culture, but I love it. Take a look. Give it to me, baby. It's another learning exercise. My final airplane in the Air Force was this wonderful North of T-38. I came back to NASA. NASA, half the NASA squadron is these airplanes here. The North of T-38 is 60 years old last year. Gorgeous. Well, half the NASA squadron was this. And the other half is this. <laughs> so you call up the field, and you can get any airplane you want. What do the astronauts want to fly? Do you want to fly this? Do you want to fly this? I'm the only one flying these airplanes. Why? Because it's going to teach me different things. That's a 1948 antique. It's a privilege to fly antique. It's Kelly Johnson's, Lockheed, the first, the first non works airplane, T 33. I want to fly this one here because it's going to go away. NASA's not keeping 1948 airplanes. But it's going to teach me different things. Believe me, flying a cockpit like that and go to Blizzard, New York City, you earned your pay. <laughs> this is really primitive, but it's a privilege. Okay, teach me different things. I continue to be an airplane mechanic. So on the way to the flight line, I stop in the hangar, and I see him working on a system that I don't understand that I want to work. So I continue to be an airplane mechanic, even though I'm supposed to be an astronaut, and working on airplanes. But it's the way I understand things. I understand things. Airplane cockpit, every single switch and every metal. When I see a switch, I see in front of my face all the wiring diagrams. I see the end vectors. I see the circuit breaking. I see the whole song, everything. That's why I understand things. I take them apart. And so, the mechanics insisted that I be the maintenance staff test on this airplane because I'm already an airplane mechanic because I think this way. A maintenance test pilot on airplanes is given heavy maintenance. And that's, it. that's critical, like engines, flight controls, hydraulics or a periodic inspection where there's pieces all over the floor. They put it back together and I fly it to see if it works. And so that's what my job is. 800 functional check flights, I didn't never find a single maintenance there the whole time. So did I have useful check? Yeah, you're going supersonic and you, you feel the vibe. Back to island, come home. Well, you know, you, uh, a maintenance test pilot is one. You set up initial business, you perturb the airplane, you see what happens, how does it respond? That's what that's all about. So that's some of the best flying I ever did. I carried a camera with me every time. I carried a camera, 
That was in my helmet. <clears throat> I don't back. I don't know. I'm just going to take pictures. It's value added. This is one gorgeous machine, and it's going to take me to do places. So I'm going to take pictures of it. And so here's this incredible view. He's 60 years old, last year. And here's some of my photography here. This is my photography. You see, is that me? No, it's not. I'm over here taking a picture. I'm going to see the view. That's the earth. When you're seeing stars in the daytime, maybe you're higher than you should be. <laughs> so, but I teach this to the investment community. You know, the people that are pushing investment, that you go stray up long enough, you're going to end up doing this. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that's the way stock markets go. And you got to pay attention, man. You're 60,000 feet a minute. You're 12 miles a minute down for Earth. You just got to pay attention every time. So I'm not here to teach uh, flight safety or bad stuff, but two of my, two of my colleagues, this is Gulf of, they left the planet. That's Gulf of Mexico. They weren't, they didn't pay attention all the time. Now at this point in life, I know I'm going to do a book, so I did end up, um, I did end up doing a book after 45 years of shooting this beauty, and so I did do. A, so at this point, I know I'm doing a book, so I'm interesting, getting some interesting backgrounds. And so this is my crystal cathedral picture. This is like stained glass window, and I got my, this wonderful view over the tails. And so, but there is no glass. It was just a nice picture. This is a, not, this is a UPS anchor. You know UPS. Well, I asked UPS if they take care of things out. And so I could borrow a hanger for a day. And of course, they said yes. Everyone says yes to me for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I talk to them nice. I cheat. <laughs> but me and the NASA mechanics got the T-38s and we filled a hanger full of T-38s here. To get this kind of picture. The hurricane I can move the hangar. It's gone. You know, it went flying. <laughs> it didn't have a nice landing either, so the hangar's gone. Hurricane, you can see how wind to catch it. And so I'm after interesting backgrounds, see, and so that's a shuttle launch. A shuttle going up here at night. And so I put my airplanes here to get a nice picture, you see. People say it's cheap. It is cheap. So I want a nice background picture. So me and the mechanics put the airplanes there. See, here's a nice picture with the airplanes. Yeah, you know what I'm doing. <laughs> now I, I do the same thing for a daytime picture. This is SPS 117, it's called for. Look at the boom. See the boom? Watch what it's gonna do for me. I don't I'm just you know, get a nice background. See what the boom did for me? Isn't this not ready? So that boom. And plumes do it. It turned into this. And I tell the sun, I need the sun to go down. <laughs> <laughs> the sun does what I wish to do. The sun's always cooperative. You see how light goes? T 38s are leaving here. Shuttle landing facility. Okay, that's what I got. That's my book. Because I've got the camera with me. See, look at the old I had the camera with me. I didn't know this was going to happen. Yeah, so there you go. Now, I also want to get some nice pictures of, of the T-38 with the shuttle, the shuttle landing. So I got permission, I put the airplane here, I got the vehicle sent me built in there, and the sun, sunset, of course, and the shuttle comes by, so I'm getting a nice background picture from my airplane. And I, they're told they shuttle back to the barn, and they saw me taking pictures. They were brilliant. They didn't just keep going. They moved the shuttle back and forth to be sure that I had the right perspective. <laughs> <laughs> so you hold the camera up there. You know how life goes? I mean, you know? I, it's just wonderful. I don't even want to be dare say Photoshop. But <laughs> I got the transparencies. Anyway, it's sunny, so there's no one on the flight line here in LA to use I jumped my VW and I'm leaving and this strange light coming over. I said, it's not an eclipse. No. Uh, why the light? I look over my shoulder and it's this, the most powerful rainbow I ever saw in my face. And it's a triple. You see the double? It's a triple. Surrounded my beauties. And so there you go. Got the camera out. Thank goodness I had saved some film. You know, because I was in formation, I could have shot up all my film, because I didn't know this was, but I had eight frames left. And so I ended up doing this book, like I showed you, can look at the book when we're done here. So after 45 years of shooting that beauty, after years and years of thousands of pictures, I then decided to do the book. 
So I wasn't there about it, Joe. Bob is the, the hardest job story in Russia I've ever had. It's hard on the body, it's hard on the mind. It's incredible discipline. It's what is the earth before, what is the altitude, every second of the way. It's just discipline, it's all. But if you look at the great, the big Paris air show, they wrecked every airplane they ever sent to Paris. Supersonic transport, airplane, FAP, they wreck them all because they don't have a plan. They don't do that. Don't do that. You develop a plan, you research the plan, you test the plan, you rehearse the plan, and you go and you pull it off as planned. <laughs> These people that wreck airplanes and air shows, they don't have a plan. I've got a plan, I never deviate. I'm sorry to be exasperated by the people. But, you know, the spectators love these kind of maneuvers. A maneuver to me is how to avoid the earth when the maneuver is over. These are my real heroes. These are my real heroes in terms of time. Southwest flew for 51 years. I never hurt anyone in the cabin. So that late 13 engine number one took out that window and the lady died of blood trauma in the cabin. But 50 more years of a very human, intensive enterprise, and they're all the same. You know, that's what it takes to be good. Delta's on an eight feet past you without uh, into the East Coast, all that good, and a newcomer comes to the game and he has shit. And so, part of that business, of course, is National Transportation Safety Board, I love it, I They are so nuanced, they're looking at the cost, all the factors that got into this game and cost us. But I use them not, and I teach them to other people. It's a whole two-hour discussion. I teach engineers to be to other people not so that you can be an accident investigator so you can see the future. You have a piece of equipment, you have an environment, you have a situation, and you see all the ways that you go. That's why I teach engineers to be. So it's a futuristic forensic paradigm I built to see the future. So I did join a program before NASA, and I was a lead spacewalker for 25 years. Why? Spacewalker have got to do work. You know, the work of something. <laughs> As a doctor, I understand the ergonomics of the suit. It's not got the same body I got. I got my body, the ergonomics of work. And three, you close that, you close the visor, you close the little physiology. Your temperature be what it gives you. What you breathe is what it gives you. And of course, number four, procedures and checklist, five upper body strength. I did a lot of the vacuum testing on Apollo. They got Apollo here, service modules. They go in there, they close me the door, close this, bring it down to a vacuum like this in there, and um, I open the door and step outside, even in the vacuum. Apollo got to function in the vacuum. We went inside the cabin to the vacuum. So I did all that. The Apollo people were so busy training. I got more vacuum time than anyone on Earth. I shouldn't brag about that. It's a nice, not a nice place to be. But anyway, I did that. So when we go to Apollo, and uh, that was uh, we had our 50th anniversary last year under the shuttle program. So I picked up Apollo in 1975. That's 18 years before I went to space. 18 years. It's not just training on a, on a year or two. I picked it up. Sorry, you the lead astronaut on this, and you and the team, you identify every failure you get to. What you gonna do about it? The space one. What you gonna do about it? So for 18 years. But you know why I got that job, you know I got that machine. I've been doing machines all my life. I think about the future, I think about the factories, what's going to drive that thing. One of one man, put the, I go the back of the bus, go to work. That's what it's all about. This is been just a few ones. Interesting. What can happen to this machine and what you're going to do about it? How do you recover the system? Do a couple of ideas. I was on Challenger's first flight, did the first uh, space shuttle. First one out the door of the shuttle program. I helped design the suit, helped design the backpack. I was on another challenge mission, a scholarly mission. I flew as a pilot on that one. I can't do the back of the bus, but sometimes I do the front of the bus to pilot. And so, of course, we had the Challenger accident. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but here's a picture of the icicles on launch day. And so, this was criminal negligence. It had nothing to do with engineering. So, if you look at the shuttle design and you look at the requirements on that system, were the requirements of the flying ice? What is this ice? It's central Florida, it's on the coast, it's warm. Do you think there was ice in the requirements and specifications for how to show it? No. A single picture is a no-go. I won't talk about the engineering buildings. Single picture, it's a no-go. It was not designed by us. Okay, we're gonna go today. 
Anyway, no more time on that. I did keep Hubble the whole time. I've known Hubble 42 years, but I flew, other, flew these other missions along the way. I was in mission control for 25 missions to lead the communicator. Yeah. And so that's where I really learned how to be a team player, collaborator. And so she is a communicator, mission control. I played on the real Hubble. That's the real Hubble. I took all of the horns out and installed with, of course, quality looking over my shoulder. But I gotta, I gotta know that I can reach it, I gotta know that I can see it, I gotta know my tools are gonna work. And so here's Hubble down at Kennedy Space Center over there. We launched it within a couple months, we found out we had the wrong here in the telescope. Now this is just horrible. This was negligence too. And so if you want to know what quality is not Allen Report, you go to any Allen Report or Hubble Mirror here and you'll find out in layperson's terms why you did that kind of thing. But it was horrible. It was not a mistake. It was negligence. So, but I gotta fix that. Now I got a mission I can focus not on every possible thing, but on the 13 systems that are broken. I involved my family in, that's with our Holly, my family in throughout the process. So of course, a lot of our tests and our training is in war. It's not the nuclear war, it's not the sort of thing, but it does. Newton's, Newton's third law, if I put a force on something, it's coming back to my body. If I push 10 pounds, I'm going 10 this way. Can I do these forces? And so it's good for that. It's good for geometry, moving big articles around. It's good. Can I see where I gotta see? Can I reach where I gotta reach? What it's not good for is how the suit's gonna work. If I go upside down the suit, I've got 150 pounds of my collarbone, the suit won't work that way. So you'll see it's neutral buoyancy. In the water tank, however my position, I got that force between me and the suit. But I show you that because I empower the divers to speak up. Before I go in a water tank, I ask every diver, you see a better way to do it? You show me you show how you would do it. So you get you listen to people. And you're trying to get people to show you how. It's, you know, you come up with a solution. I did the same thing in medicine. I never did a single medical procedure way back when I started back in the 60s. Okay, folks, well, anyone in this room is uncomfortable, you know you don't. You don't like what they're doing. I need to know if anyone's uncomfortable. So comfort is a nice word. It's not a legal word. It means I don't feel good about it. So she went. Got her new nurse. She's been the job for 30 years. She see what I'm doing at the end of 100 other doctors. She knows more than a surgeon does. But if she has a suggestion and you bite her head off, she'll never speak again. The arrogance I've seen in the past is just hard. List people. And so you know the cost of Concordia, the night case cat, he's going close to the shore. And the night of this accident, he had his girlfriend under the bridge, he's gonna push even harder. Yes, he ran into the ground. Okay, what, and uh, the company saw him be beating every time they went. My question is, where was the first mate? What was the first mate doing? Seeing this deviant. The second mate, the third mate. Speak up, folks. You don't tolerate deviants. That's it. Go ahead and fire me, but we ain't doing it. See, it's just right. It's insisted upon the plan. It's insisted upon the right. Now the Hubble's up there. I'm worried about the toys that are getting me a play. And so, I'm the fidelity. Are they real? But this engineering qualification unit in the Smithsonian. It was guaranteed, built alongside Hubble as a test article, guaranteed to have the same thing. So of course, I brought me tools. I'm going to install that in the room I love upstairs when I get there. But here, I'm seeing fit and function, and it works here, and I'm training my body. Yes, I'm not in the suit, but I'm training my body what it takes to do that job. So I'm at those details again. I'll have to go to the Smithsonian when I start. <clears throat> now here's the real test that's in the vacuum chamber at the temperatures and you anticipate in flight. And I'm rehearsing to do that uh, tomorrow. Now, what's the temperature? What's the temperature in flight? There's no air, so it's purely a creative exchange. But there's three things to consider. There's Mother Earth. Me space walker, I'm going to be out here with Earth. Because our Earth is average 59 Fahrenheit. You go around the Earth, you've got night and day, yes, and you've got different seasons every half an hour. But your average temperature on Earth is 59, and my suit and my tools will be 59. Just give me Mother Earth. You say the sun will burn you up. The sun's 6,000, but it's only the area of your thumb. Around it is 3 degrees Kelvin. You come out fine. What you can't tolerate is the blackness of space. It's minus 470. If you don't, if you give me the blackness of space, you don't give me the sun, you don't give me the earth, I'm out of the game in 10 minutes. My temperature in the spacewalk will be the attitude of the shuttle during the spacewalk. They didn't get creative enough. I kept playing with them for months. But it's complicated. At times, I had three open doors of the, show, of the Hubble in my choreography, what I'm going to do, and you can't let sunlight be inside the vehicle. You'll burn it and off-gas it. 
And so they got a point in tennis here and there, and very complicated, but they weren't creative enough. They run, they'd be running minus 120 Fahrenheit, right? I told them it won't work. I followed them for months, okay. So I went ahead and ran at minus 120 Fahrenheit. I got insulated gloves, but not that insulated. It hurt so bad. But I came out of there with eight dead fingers. So this is me six months before flight. I got eight dead fingers. You know, eight dead fingers like this. And, uh, but, so now, I got a cardio back, how I'm gonna handle tools and how I'm gonna get the shot done. Not only the standard way, but I got a choreograph if I don't have these fingers and I don't have this flesh. So you see, that's the problem I'm up against. You think NASA might have thought about um, relieving me and sending someone else, but NASA not. <laughs> we know story. He doesn't need fingers. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. I still get the job done. You see, it's choreographies. What is the plan? How are you going to push in the tool? How are you going to handle it? If you ain't got this thing, how are you going to handle it? It's just a plan. You come up with a plan. And that part of it is a job done already now. I got fingers. But, uh, so it took me five years. That's the end of my medical career. That was the end. It took me five years to get hands over a uh, bit of use. Back. But, that's around just about, we got the problem, we got creative, and I want to fly the new mission, those people just knew they come up with that, oh, we'll get to them. So that's round test. Here's, here's the two thing picture, here's the upper crew running now over there at KSC. And look at these beautiful pictures stacking that thing up. Now, way back when, early in the shuttle program, when we needed to come out, how we're going to transport the shuttle, like from California to Florida, NASA's plan was to mount two engines on the wing. At a horrible cost. I mean, and, and, and flight dynamics and control, they were going to fly the shuttle like a jet into a jet motors back here. But it was a remote control person. It was an RC person that came up with the idea of putting a shuttle on the 747. He built in a six foot 747, and he's flying that around with the shuttle on top of it. And, and the media caught on to that. And NASA said, my God, maybe we could do that in the real world. So that's where the idea came from. The lesson for you is the project manager who's on your team. If you got an oceanography team, maybe you need to have a, a, a big wave of surfing. Or maybe you need a scuba diver. So it's who's on your project management team. If you only got traditional people, you'll get a traditional answer. <coughs> project management, you come up with a new idea. If you only got standard people, you're going to get a standard answer. So that's the lesson I got in terms of project management. So I've got to finish about 6.30. If I go to 6.35, is that going to hurt anyone? No. no. Okay. Huh? So you know the procedure start managing up, and you can get this PowerPoint from me. It's very much good to have it. I'm showing you the best I got in the way to launch that a beautiful sunset. This is the highest point in my 30-year career with NASA. And that is the flight formation with your friends, and you say, which one you know? I'm the third one out here taking this picture. <laughs> 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 but your flight formation, when you're going to go fly with him tomorrow, but you like, hey, I'm climbing in that thing. I go fix Hubble tomorrow. You see, that, this is out there. It's what's going on in your head, your heart, with this. And of course you don't buzz this place, no, you <laughs> You rehearse it ahead of time. You get a plan, ma'am, and you call up the authorities. <laughs> hey, this is Dory. Yes, sir, I do. We would like to be able to fly down here. What time? <laughs> okay, I'm just saying, this is a plan. Talk to people. Listen to them. Is this okay? Right. Get it right. And they love you for doing it. You just inspire the troops coming by on formation. Do it right. You have rehearsed this thing, and they know you're coming. With Troy, he's my suit tank. Troy here, he's, he takes my helmet, he, my gloves, the whole time. He's the last person I see before I depart. He's passed in and leaves. And so we raised the bar for 30 years. It just got better and better. You just keep doing it. I'll good for you, Ben. And he, he left last year, so he's gone. But it ain't going to my heart. So where we go, this is not outrageous. This is one of my most beautiful pictures. And they sent me an email. The person who lives over here took it. He sent it. Yeah, you like this one? I love it. Sorry. It's, love it. it's a lot better than the cameras that are right close to launch pad. It's a beautiful picture. It's not beautiful flying this thing. It's not inside. It's not so nice. 
the chain ran on a roll, man. You don't, you know, it's not so nice inside. I did, I was the only one to fly on every shuttle. I got to fly on every one of them, the only one. The reason that ever occurred to anyone is 10 fingernails invented every instrument fan. They did the DNA on them, they found out it was me. <laughs> <laughs> we in space, we go get home. After 18 years now, I've gotten back in the bus, going to work. Yes, we deserve this. The wrong bear, it's a horrible thing, but also the early bears. When you buy a new car and it breaks before you get home, it ain't because it wore out. It's just quality or design. When things fail, I mean, it's quality or design. It's not the wore out. And so those other components, the other 12 components that fail, should not have broken. This one I do take up with. I train with the best athletes in the world, including Dorothy Hamill, figure skating. But I'm an athlete. See, the way I look upon things is, me and my suit and the tools, we go on, we do a dance out there. It's a dance. It's like ballet. Me and the tools, we do a dance. We get the job done when we don't. But that's how close you choreograph every finger and every toe, every movement in the way. The same as the athlete. I'm an athletic player. So I brought a profession of athleticism to the spacewalk in the world. And it's a real spacewalk. The dog on the admiration. I got for these folks. 200,000 volts. And so I, I trained with them. I raised their bar, and they raised my bar. We do this thing together. And so after Hurricane Irvin, which you remember, Irvin had gone to Florida, Duke Energy brought all these troops in from outside to put it all back together. Before he sent them home, he said, story. You're going to go climb a pole with these people before they go home. OK, here I go. I knew they were going to call. <laughs> but Duke does tell me. You do know a story when you're up the pole, don't have any juice in the line, you know. They're not going to take But anyway, you cannot help but be inspired. Don't want to go about this. So there I am after 18 years, southern, southern Australia came to the world. After 18 years, it will take love of the Lord, like I say. I want them up, I want them out, looking over my shoulder. That's an optical box I put in the fix uh, for the world of there. That's your, your beautiful camera, 700 pound camera. That's when it brings you the pictures from Hubble, the visual 